Downing Lu. I am a reader in modern Chinese culture and language at the source, where I teach Chinese cinema and culture. I'm delighted to chair today's webinar delivered by Professor Mingwei Song. Mingwei and I have known each other for a long time since we both studied at the Fudan University in Shanghai. Therefore, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome an old friend and an internationally renowned scholar to give a talk today. Mingwei Song is a professor of Chinese literary studies and the chair of the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at Wesley University in the United States. In 2020, Professor Song was elected to, to the Delegate Assembly of Modern Language Association, MLA. Since 2022, he has served as the president of the Association of Chinese Comparative Literature. In, uh, uh, Professor Song's research interests include uh, modern Chinese literature, the Bildungsroman, science fiction, post-human theories, and the neo-baroque aesthetics. He is the author of Young China, National Rejuvenation and the Bildungsroman 1900 to 1959, uh, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2015. His forthcoming monograph is entitled Fear of Seeing, the Poetics and the Politics of Chinese Science Fiction. Uh, it will be published by Columbia University Press uh, this year. He also co-edited a master read anthology entitled The Reincarnated Giant, an anthology of 21st century Chinese science fiction. Uh, this collection showcases the best of contemporary Chinese science fiction from Taiwan, Hong Kong, and mainland China. In addition, uh, Professor Song has authored nine books in Chinese including not only several academic books, but also poetry and fiction. Most recently, he co-authored a collection of poetry, which was published by Taipei's Ryefield Press last December. Uh, his poems and uh, short stories have been translated into English and uh, Italian. In today's webinar, Professor Song will speak for about an hour, followed by Q&A. If you'd like to raise questions or make comments, please use the Q&A box. Uh, if you'd like to stay anonymous, you are welcome to do so, uh, but you are, you are also welcome to uh, speak, uh, give a bit of information as to who you are. This will help us to understand uh, where the questions are coming from. Without further ado, let me hand over to Professor Song. Thank you so much, Xiaoning. Indeed, you mentioned that uh, yeah, we were indeed classmates uh, back at Fudan such a long time ago, but you haven't changed at all. And I, I think this moment is really science fictional. It makes me feel like tra time traveling back to, uh, back to the future, back to the past. Okay, now, um, okay, now I'm all alone, I know. All right, I will... Uh, I really appreciate uh, everyone coming to this webinar. Um, um, this talk is uh, uh, it's based on uh, some of my re recent research on uh, the Xi SF or the women science fiction writers emerging in China in the recent years. Uh, but still, I want to give you the framework why I think about it. Uh, this topic and why it matters. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint and uh, and uh, let me share my PowerPoint. Yes, okay. All right, I'm going to... Um, can you see the PowerPoint? Is it shared now? Yes, I can see it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, <laughs> If you go to view. Yes, I want to go to, yeah, go to a uh, slideshow maybe, right? Yeah, slideshow. Yes, okay. I really like the design you did uh, uh, on your website, uh, the rise of Shi SF, Chinese science fiction's next wave with those 
very subtle um, kind of a strings, almost like a cosmic dance of uh, elements and uh, waves and the particles. Uh, all right, uh, but uh, there's another way, uh, there's another title for this talk, which is, uh, which is, uh, um, yeah, new wonders of uh, a non-binary universe. It's really, it's basically the same thing. But uh, um, I, well, on the on the on the one hand, she SF is uh, uh, what has been used in mainland China to call the Pa Ke Huan, Nu Ta. Yeah, she SF. Um, at the same time, actually, it's a effort to break uh, down the binary structure of uh, genre and gender. So um, if we can go one step further, we should call it non-binary universe. Uh, but uh, in the in the context of mainland China, um, it's still very much uh, limited to the Xi SF. Even, even that has been, um, uh, it has, has received quite a lot of attention, but still, very much marginalized. Um, I, I I want to start by mentioning um, an article that I recently written in Chinese. It's it's, a, it's about Liu Yuquan Ken, Ken Liu. Um, I when when I was trying to write about his science fiction. Um, this was was written in Chinese. I realized that uh, at the heart of Ken Liu's science fiction, there was always this really the poetic heart. Um, I think I captured that moment. For example, uh, in many of uh, his poems, uh, we can see the images and uh, um, even the personification of uh, certain images coming from this uh, 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 point at the St. Vincent Millet. Uh, she was active in the early, she was active before the rise of modernism. So today she was mostly forgotten, but uh, she's kind of between uh, Emily Dickinson and uh, then Marie, uh, between Dickinson and uh, Maria Moore, um, uh, but she's then I, I I read he I read her poems. I found she's very audacious, and very imaginary, and uh, that connects Ken Liu's fiction to you know the way how Ken Liu could. Reappropriate a lot of the poetic elements from uh, Miller's poems in his fiction, give me the key to understanding Ken Liu. Um, then I wrote, then wrote this and uh, sent it to Ken Liu. Ken said, "Nobody, <laughs> basically, he said nobody found it. You found it. That's that's indeed the key." I felt very happy about that, but uh, I I won't be you know. Um, be, be, be kind of like a, uh, I think it's just a, um, because I also write poems. So I found that that in it. But uh, 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 at the same time, there are other poems, uh, that, uh, uh, other poets that often appear in Ken Liu's writing, such as W.H. Auden, One of the, the Land, All Together Elsewhere, Vast Hers of Rinder. Uh, was even used as a title for one of the new stories. Okay, so seeing this, I want to create uh, a non-binary, not not me. Indeed, this came from Su Yang Chu. Um, sorry, this is in Chinese because the PowerPoint is all mixed, but I will give you the English. Um, I want to, simply I want to create this affinity between uh, genres that can break the Usually non-binary, uh, usually the binary structure that uh, that categorize each in its own fixed place. So, um, uh, uh, Sun Yang Chen wrote a wonderful book to Mandford Dream of a Little Sleep, 
uh, in which she first argued that uh, science fiction and realism are actually uh, the same, uh, which is very audacious, very productive. She basically, she, uh, she argued that science fiction is a high intensity mimesis, while realism is only a low intensity mimesis. So in that capacity, science fiction can be can beat realism, conventional realism, to unpack the world from within to get into the world's all different dimensions. So this is a similar to what we use the Newtonian physics to understand the appearance of the world and to use quantum physics to go into the you know high intensity um not share uh, the universe in not in a not share um but that's only the beginning of her book her book actually is not about realism her book is actually about poetry she said this um Science fiction and lyric poetry are jointly, sorry, um, sorry, uh, uh, I hear, I hear submit a theory that might initially sound implausible, but will, I hope, have become more convincing by the end of this book. Science fiction and lyric poetry are joined in separately by rich affinities. And uh, she used a, 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 a quite range of, a wide range of uh, uh, affinities, including verbal intensity, uh, including the musicality, the mu mu musicality, and the time, lyric time, things like that. Okay, so um, I always feel I owed a lot of debt to this remarkable remarkable scholar Su Yang Chu, my peer, and uh, I learned from her. And uh, I think uh, um, without uh, her theories, I couldn't have come to my uh, understanding of the Chinese science fiction um, here. Okay, so inspired by Su Yang Chu, I began to use science fiction as a method. I have a, I have a list of quite a few different uh, um, ways to use the method. But here what matters is I use science fiction as a method to rearrange gender and the genre and gender in a non-binary structure that brought us to the Xi SF. Um, about the genre, I actually a few years ago I used. Uh, um, I know, I know. I always have a new audience, but I have old audience. Some old audience are already familiar with this, but the new audience do not know this. Um, so I will say this very briefly. I I did a thought experiment in two thousand eighteen, the at the one hundredth anniversary of uh, Lu Xun's Madman's Diary, which was considered. The, the most important piece for Chinese, modern Chinese literature. But I ask this naughty question, can we read the Madman's Diary as science fiction? Uh, interestingly, this question caused a lot of uh, controversy, but eventually it uh, uh, even made its way into Chinese Gaokao Jiku. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, it became I think it's, it's, it's uh, institutionalized eventually by the system uh, to make it a, a question that is legitimate to ask the question, can we read the Madman's Diary as science fiction? But that's not my intention. I do not want to make it legitimate. I want to keep it illegit illegitimate because I want to make it always provocative. So this question does not bear a certain answer, it, it, it's, meant, it's meant to destabilize the literary structure, the literary history, to bring up to all the, you know, to unleash uh, the demons of uncertainty. Um, that's also where the title of my book that Xiaoning introduced uh, just now came from. Uh, so in that book, I talked about this. I basically, I 
believe Lu Xun's amendment theory um, is much more profoundly related to the structure of feeling and also the scientific knowledge about the world than we thought. Um, so we can we can agree that Lu uh, Xun did Lu Xun know about the quantum revolution? I found some clues, but here I, I, I don't have time to give you all the clues. I found some clues to 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 demonstrate that Lu Xun was indeed aware of the uh, what was happening in Germany at that time uh, about the physics. Okay, so uh, but the, here is not the place to talk about this. Uh, what I want to see is that uh, basically I use this first question, this first proactive question to unpack science fiction or to uh, to really to rearrange science fiction's position in Chinese literary history, uh, not to, not just to put science fiction back to Chinese literature, but also to uh, to actually to redefine the origin of uh, Chinese literary modernity as a. Uh, uh, we can see as a, a singularity, which is not real, which is not about realism, but actually is very much about a new way of seeing. Uh, and this new way of seeing is, uh, uh, it was inspired by the new scientific knowledge and the new epistemology, which, uh, uh, Prevailed, which began to emerge and prevailed, and uh, um, that uh, uh, got into uh, the entire school of quant uh, quantum physics, and that got into Stra Stravinsky, the music, and uh, uh, Picasso, that got into philosophy, that got into um, um, Many many things, and uh, uh, that changed the fabric of the reality, as one scholar, David Deutsch, called. David Deutsch believed the Darwin Darwin's theory and the Freud theory and uh, the quantum physics changed the fa the fabric of the reality, and that's exactly what Lu Xun did. And uh, that's exactly what science fiction did. Science fiction also, yeah, basically re. Uh, 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 science fiction by nature uh, is a thought experiment that uh, tried to ask what if or uh, to give us a totally different image of the world as a, a cognitive, cognitively infringing to use Taco Suvin's definition or simply uh, Wanderers like the Baroque. Okay, um, this talk is not about Ruxin. This talk is about the second thing. Uh, later, I begin to develop my second proactive question. Okay, another very naughty question. That is, can we read Liu Cixin as a non-binary writer, or can we read Liu Cixin's text as a non-binary text? Uh, this question made Liu Cixin unhappy, I believe. Um, because Liu Cixin is called the big Liu and uh, he's all the signs of the masculinity. And um, um, after the success of the three body problem, three body novels, Liu Cixin was considered the pride of China and uh, people celebrated him because he elevated China's position in the world even though this is just the science fiction, and even though Luxin's success actually has nothing to do with the Chinese propaganda machine, it's actually his success was really made possible by science fiction fans. But uh, on the receiving end, the Chinese readers, Chinese fans, all celebrated Luxin as the most 
um, kind of a, um, a magnificent of achievement in Chinese literature um, as if China indeed invaded the United States by science fiction. Um, and this show of the uh, very strong masculinity and uh, um, what came together with it, what, in the beginning it was called the Santi Dang, the party of the three body that evolved into industrial party and evolved into um, several different uh, schools of thoughts that were very popular among the young people, the millennials, the, those who were in their thirties. They all believed in the dark forest scenario as a real politic um, scenario. So they all, um, they all called the Liu Cixin like the godfather of science fiction. Yeah, Wang Lao Shu sometimes joked that I'm the godfather. I'm not, I'm, I'm totally not the godfather. Uh, Liu Cixin is, Liu Cixin was considered really like the father, not the godfather, really the father of the, of the fatherland, uh, uh, the father image uh, that could match the fatherland. So there's uh, even some uh, uh, shimmering of uh, fascis fascism in the, this new, in those new scholars interpretation of uh, the third body problems, the sublime aesthetics uh, corresponding to moist uh, revolution to uh, China's current uh, campaign to become the number one. So my question is really, it's truly untimely and uh, unpopular. How can I, read Liu Cixin as a non-binary writer. Uh, of course, Liu Cixin is not a non-binary writer, but how can I read his text as a non-binary? Um, okay, I have my reasons. And I indeed, I, uh, I even recently when I was watching the three body film, um, when I, when I was watching the Wandering Earth too, and when I was watching the three body TV drama, I don't know if you're watching it. I thought, well, the Wandering Earth too is just, you know, techno technologically speaking, it's, a, it's wonderful, but it's, it does not have the poetic heart. I think without, I, Earlier, a long time ago, when I corresponded with Liu Cixin often, I thought fundamentally he is a poet like uh, Ken Liu. Maybe that's why when Liu Cixin's three body novels were first published, it's mostly some Chinese poets who wrote reviews about him, like Liao Weitang. And it's uh, the poet Ken Liu who found it's so powerful, so um, so beautiful. Um, of course, this is this this argument is rather arrogant. I won't go that far. Um, I refuse any certainty. So this is not a certain state. It's not a statement showing any certainty, but. Uh, what I want to say is that I think Liu Cixin, based on my understanding of uh, him as a person and his writing, I think he had a soft, a soft spot that is poetry, the poetic heart. So uh, when I was revising my, my, my book, Favorite Scene, I eventually uh, re uh, renamed, I gave the title for Liu Cixin, the, the, the title for the chapter of Liu Cixin, a new, a new title, yeah, before it was called uh, Between the Sublime Cosmos and the uh, Macro Era. Now I changed it to A Poetic Heart in the Dark Forest. I just want to highlight this, uh, this part of Liu Cixin that has been 
overlooked for such a long time, or eventually uh, almost being pushed up the Liu Cixin, even being pushed up the Liu Cixin himself when he began to accept all these new uh, interpretations of him, his writings as a testimonial to China's national strengths. Okay, but I have a reason I, uh, let me skip this, sorry. Uh, surely, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I want, yeah, that's another thing I want to remind people. But uh, a mainland, uh, a very important mainland uh, scholar, Wu Yan, whom I respect tremendously, he, uh, he wrote a book and in that book he, grouped the science fiction writers by gender. Um, he gave women science fiction writer a good place. He first talked about women science fiction writer. He particularly reminded people that science fiction was created by a woman. Indeed, yes, that's Mary Shirley. Uh, but then he grouped the, all the other science fiction writer as the big boys, like Liu Cixin as a big boy. Um, okay, I have a, I respect uh, Wu Yan's uh, respect for women science fiction writers, but I have a problem with this uh, uh, categories, all these categories. Um, I think science fiction is a queer. <laughs> okay, this is of course another joke, but uh, uh, as a way to, uh, just to, to provoke, to simply to to put things in question. Science fiction may have a, if we really talk about the blood land, science fiction has one grandmother, Mary Shirley, but the two fathers, Julie Verna and H.G. Wells. This is not my, what I said is, this was first said by a British author, Adam Roberts, but I often, co I often quoted it and then, I loved Virginia Woolf's uh, idea uh, for writing Orlando, a biography beginning in the year 1500 and continuing to the present day called Orlando Vita only with one, with a change about from one sex to the other. Uh, later, Virginia Woolf indeed wrote this novel, her most fantastic novel, or her only novel of a fantasy, Orlando. And uh, uh, the year 1500 was very important to the history of science fiction because that's roughly the time period when science fiction as a genre began to come into being um, with uh, uh, the age of the great, at the age of the great, geographical discovery, but also in the epoch of uh, Baroque. Um, what I found in Liu Cixin, let's say, I think in Liu Cixin's writings, uh, women are never marginalized. First of all, Ye Wenjie is the, is the person who made the first contact with the aliens. Even though we can say she's like a nemesis, the goddess with revenge or whatever. But uh, when I saw in the TV show, uh, The Three Body, I felt before, Ye uh, before, before the young Ye Wenjie appears, the show was a little bit, uh, it was entertaining, but it was just entertaining. But when Ye Wenjie, appeared in the in the show you know because of the censorship the tv drama had to be delayed the, the release was delayed for a year uh, they had to cut out all the mentioning of the cultural revolution everything but even just uh, you know in even just eyes you can see everything you can see the sadness of the time the madness of the of the time. You can see her despire and her fear and uh, 
her simply her loss of trust in people. You see everything in it. And that, then from that moment, the TV show became really interesting in the sense that it gained the meaning larger than the show itself. Uh, so Yi Jie was not just a, a character in the story. She actually has a lasting power, uh, like agency uh, of uh, pushing. You know, she does, she does not just push the button, she push the story to go deeper and deeper. And the uh, dark forest came from her, not from the dark forest, the theory came from Ye Wen Jie too, not from Luo Ji, okay. Uh, then the second uh, important pro female protagonist, Zhuang Yan, was considered like Eve in the Garden of Eden, very adult, kind of like very flat. People thought that character was very flat. But if you read carefully, this character has a very subtle resistance. She is a woman and she is herself. She does not fit completely the fantasy, the male fantasy of Luo Ji, the playboy. She appears to be that, she even pretends to be that, but eventually she left Luo Ji. And it's only her departure that pushed Luo Ji to become the real uh, war facer. To become the real war facer, the real sword holder. So Zhuang Yan played a much larger role than um, we uh, usually credited. Now let's talk about, I think particularly important is uh, Cheng Xin. Um, Cheng Xin received quite a lot of the, um, where is my, here, yeah. Uh, uh, received a lot of criticism from the um, okay. As for Cheng Xin, her tenderness forms the pointing heart of the entire trilogy. She's the only character who transcends the dark forest scenario breathing a warm human kindness to the cold, dark, immoral universe. When we finally, um, yeah, so when we finally understand that the entire narrative uh, is Cheng Xin's like a message in the bottle, the, nar the narratorial voice becomes blurry. Is it Cheng Xin's voice or the author Liu Cixin's voice? However, in, you know, in, um, in that atmosphere, when I talk about the, when the industrial party was on the rise, when uh, readers militarized uh, uh, the dark forest uh, scenario, uh, received the three body problem as purely like uh, showing the muscles and the masculinity. Um, uh, the moral judgment targeting Cheng Xin in the science fiction circle goes far beyond the texture level. Cheng Xin due to her kind heart and the empathy fails to accomplish her mission as the sword holder to exterminate the enemy and all lives on earth. The web is filled with netizens calling her Sheng Mu Biao. I, I, I found how to translate it and eventually I found the help from a student of mine. She translated it as a soft hearted bitch. A little similar, yeah. Uh, or Virgin Mary, Holy Mother, but uh, soft hearted bitch, Sheng Mu Biao. This 
derogatory words have flown after the discussion about the novel to become a gender crusade, a misogynistic fanaticism. Okay, what I try to do, uh, very much inspired by some of my women um, fellow scholars, in particular, I want to mention the name Ying Ying Huang, Huang Ying Ying, because I read one of her papers, realized that uh, she gave me this very important epiphany that is uh, um, uh, uh, the three body problem has a deeper time. Uh, 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 Huang Ying Ying analyzed this poem written by a singer, the so-called cleaner, but who's also a poet, a singer. And it, it is a lover. We don't know its sex. We don't know whether it has a sex or not. Uh, but uh, Ying Ying Huang, uh, uh, Huang Ying Ying analyzed uh, this poem and uh, uh, Ying Ying Huang teaching at Lafayette College. I, I really want to yeah, call up to praise her for finding this, and I was inspired by her thought. And I think in this, um, we see uh, the, the deeper structure in Liu Cixi's trilogy, which may not be in the consciousness of the author when he wrote about those scientific speculations. But this is a, this is a, a deeper level of uh, uh, textuality. Um, um, which I, yeah, if I could, let's, let me see. I, I think it, it, it really responses to Zhu Tianwen's Fendersiacus Splendor in a certain way, even though Liu Cixin may have never read Zhu Tianwen's Fendersiacus Splendor. It's about the end of the world. And it's also the adding chunk. An Ading Chang question about a human, you know, man die or man is buried, but there's a woman, the like a uh, a goddess, will comfort the dead after you are asleep. I will tuck you in. Or in Harvey's words, our mother planet Gaia has been ruined. Humans, men, or mostly men, must we learn how to stay with the trouble, developing tentacular thinking, relying on the direct experience of bodily senses. Humans must merge into the one with the devastated nature in all its monstrosity, non-binary, between man and woman, between human and non-human. And this is the deeper time that I, uh, I think that's very important uh, to consider in, in Liu Cixin's Three Body trilogy. So I, I know um, Liu Cixin won't agree with me. Uh, Liu Cixin does not agree with a lot of my argument about him, but I don't think the author can dictate uh, his own writing. Um, and the, my arguments do not aim to create any uh, statement of certainty, but rather to unpack, to kind of, uh, it's like to, 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 uh, to break down uh, some uh, fixed uh, structure to see Liu Cixin is a, a male writer and his text is the manifestation, manifestation of uh, the strength of the nation uh, in the image of uh, uh, all those uh, male generous strategists like uh, Luo Ji, like uh, Zhang Beihai, um, while the readers all kind of uh, um, tried to push the women characters um, 
for the margin as uh, insignificant or even counterproductive. But I think in Liu-Qi's in Liu three body trilogy, it's always women's characters who played a much larger role in executing the power of like a human agency in the unfolding of the plot. Um, we don't have time to, to talk more about this. And I think I have already used a lot of my time. Now let's talk about uh, she SF. Okay, this is the question. Um, after the success of the Liu Cixin, I think Chinese science fiction or entire Chinese literary field was very much unprepared. And then nobody could uh, uh, could simply speculate what would come after. So people always waited for Liu Cixin to write another masterpiece, like uh, another three body trilogy. But Liu Cixin was working under tremendous pressure. I, I knew he, he, over the years, he wrote a lot, but uh, none of those manus manuscripts he felt was was even equal to the three body trilogy. Maybe one day he will give us another miracle, but that's not uh, that's not the way to think. We, if we think what will come next is like a, another is like a, to use the Chinese, from Sheng Li, to Sheng Li, a win win to from triumph to triumph. That's a very Hegelian teleological thinking. I, I was rather pessimistic in the beginning. I thought after the success of the three body trilogy, Chinese science fiction had its uh, supernova moment and it, then it would die out. Uh, that's really my thought. Uh, and I think I even influenced my 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 teacher, Professor Wang, he, he even talked about this to the press. Um, like a Kehuai in Guochula, science fiction, somehow this moment was was, was gone. Um, even though we, we really cherish some other writers like uh, Han Song, um, who was not like Liu, who, whose writings were not like Liu Cixin. Uh, Liu Xin is all sublime. Actually, Liu Xin is sublime in the dark. And Han Song is chthonic and dark. Uh, Han Song is, is, is a irrational and dark. Well, Liu Cixin is a very scientific and dark. Okay. Um, even though we have the diversity, uh, we have a different writer, we have Chen Qiufan, who, who is closer to reality, to the near reality, and who has more eagerness for the social engagement. But it's during the pandemic when I received, uh, somehow received uh, some gifts from uh, a few very young writers. Then I, in about 2020, I realized this is, this is it. This is the next wave. This is the Xi SF. This is the Chinese women writers or non women and non binary writers, some writers. Um, are perhaps non-binary, but I want to give you a larger context if we include this, this new next wave in the larger Sinophone literary context, we can certainly call it non-binary. So it is the she SF and the non-binary writers who quietly made a new wave, a next new wave. Um, Okay, uh, maybe I should say a few words about new wave. I I use new wave as a phrase to describe the moment of uh, Chinese science fiction, contemporary Chinese science fiction, when it truly presented almost like a paradigm shift in the literary imagination uh, to the twenty first century Chinese literature, where yesterday, uh, just yesterday. I read a 
long article published in a very important Chinese journal, that article began with a sentence that is realism, no doubt, how we even realism, uh, is still our most uh, uh, important or most uh, um, uh, significant uh, uh, standard, how we even, okay, that's, that's the, that's the standard narrative in Chinese literature about Chinese literature. And uh, I use new wave, I basically, I render science fiction as a new wave, almost like avant-garde literary movement to challenge this realism. Of course, there are many different other ways to challenge realism, like a real avant-garde fiction in the 1980s, and also uh, like a myth of realism created by Yan Lianke, and even Mo Yan's hallucinatory, hallucinatory magic realism, all these different, uh, you know, variations of realism already challenged uh, this golden rules of Chinese realism. But science fiction did something totally different. Science fiction decoupled representation and reality. It changed the relationship. For all the other realism, realisms, or all the other even avant-garde fiction, it always there's a the object first. But in science fiction, is the representation conceives. Often, is the re representation conceives the world. So, world building is a inbuilt mechanism in the genre. So, science fiction has to be, you know, uh, create a world. So that's what I call the new wave. Uh, that's I. That's how I value and treasure this particular momentum of uh, uh, science fiction in the, in the context of Chinese literature. Then, then I realized when everyone wanted, when, when everyone only wanted to repeat what Liu Xin did, I think there's no way for it to continue. The momentum is, is going to die out. But then I found the Xi SF. Xi SF, SF is not a powerful movement. It's a, it's a very quiet movement. Um, so I ask, does science fiction has gender? A genre of fiction, it is in the Chinese context often marked with a series of binary categories such as hard SF versus soft SF. Golden age versus new wave. Well, for them, new wave is too literary. And technological SF versus social SF. SF surnamed science versus SF surnamed literature, and so on and so forth. If these binaries, Chinese diehard SF fans who took these binaries for granted usually prefer the formers and view them as manifestations of true SF spirit. Science, science fiction is hard, street, technological, and sublime. If science fiction has a gender, it's often associated with geeky guy, street guy, and the nerdy guy. Okay. So actually, if we look at the writings by women writers in, say, between 1997 and 2012, we actually see a lot of women writers who wrote like men. It's like, this is a game. This is the rules of game. You have to play that rule. So a lot of women writers use the I narrator perspective, but the I narrator is a man. And they, they try to imitate the male perspective of the male. So indeed, for some time, even Hao Jingfang, uh, uh, I, I have a, I want to, just to come up to another name, Kara Healy. Kara Healy um, is a young scholar based in uh, based at a Wabash College. Um, 
she wrote about Hao Jingfang's gender stereotype. She found Hao Jingfang as a woman writer actually uh, repeated the Cai Zi Jia Ren, the beauty and the scholar stereotype, and uh, sort of uh, um, kind of strengthened the gender stereotypes in her fiction. Indeed, that's true. That's exactly what I think quite a lot of earlier women writers were doing. But things changed with uh, these books, uh, The Way Spring Arrives, um, some other books, and particularly when I, uh, I really don't have time, but I, I want to show you, sorry, we have to skip all of this. I don't know why we have all this. Yeah, all these male writers, they are very handsome, but uh, sorry to skip them. Baroque, let's skip all the Baroque. Let's skip all of them. Yeah. Oh, too many, sorry, yeah. Um, in Zhu Tianwen's, Finder Sex Splendor, of course, uh, Finder Sex Splendor is not a science fiction, but we can read it as a science fiction if we use science fiction as a method, because it was written in 1990, but it's about what will have happened between 1990 and the 2000. And it ends with this very famous quote, the abysmal blue of the lake tells her that the world of men have built, the theories and systems will collapse. And she, with her memory of smells, the colors will survive and rebuild the world from here. That is a different way of thinking. That is, a, so even in Han, let's say, even in Han Song, uh, a writer who is very different from Liu Cixin, in, in many ways, in, in, in writing, in thinking, in ideology, in ideological tendencies, and in terms of liberalism versus the uh, fascism. I think Han Song has a much, much larger tolerance for different things, but Han Song's perspective is still very much built in that, what I call here, the word man have built with theories and systems. And uh, then this new word, uh, Zhu Tianwen uh, uh, predicts, uh, this mouse is uh, resisting. Okay, mouse. Okay, now, um, then a few years, um, after Zhu Tianwen, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a paper about uh, this thread in Taiwan. I realized it's very interesting, just a few years after, after Zhu Tianwen's writing, I see in Ji Dawei's short story beneath his eyes in your palm, right, right, a right, right rose is about to bloom. A very similar tendency of showing us um, a world that was like built by some corporations replacing the nation to manipulate the human world. Actually, it's only an illusion. Well, the, 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 the truth of the world was actually the the unlimited repetition of uh, the experiments of uh, making lives by a gay couple. By the way, one of the gay couples, one of the gays' name is uh, Dakar. The protagonist of the do and joins dream of the electric sheep. Um, and uh, then, all the people are the same person, but they are 
all different. They are the same genes, but they vary. So beneath his eyes in your palm is actually the same. Okay, the story is too complicated to, to, to introduce here, but I want to mention it. I want to mention it is that, please remember in 1994 in Taiwan, the non-binary universe of science fiction was already born with all the new Baroque splendor. Um, I will skip all this, uh, skip all this, sorry. Sorry, let's skip all this. So finally, in, in a story like uh, um, the solar studio single Taiyang Xi Pian Chang, I found a perfect text. I got to read this text in 2020. Then I later realized this text, this story was never published. I was astonished. How could such a wonderful text never published? But the author told me that uh, they all consider it too difficult to understand. Indeed, it uh, is a very difficult. It's a very difficult text. Um, the author's name is a. Uh, uh, Deep Terror or Shuang Shi Mu, uh, like a fly, uh, like a, uh, sorry, I was sorry, I, I just saw the, I was distracted by the chat. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, go back there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't know its gender, and I cannot find her picture. I know she's a woman, but I can't find her picture. I don't want to ask her for a picture. So I don't have a picture to show you. But this story is uh, really marvelous in the sense that it is a text that weaves into itself a sta the staging of a, a Chekhov's Seagull, that very famous light comedy. Of course, Chekhov's comedy is always very tragic, but uh, it's still laughable, very laughable, humorous in, in, in a good way. Um, that's the play when there's a gun, yeah, how Chekhov's gun can help you with description. Yes, is when you have a gun, the gun has to be shot, okay. But this play in this story is not staged in the in a Euro, in a Euro studio. It's staged in the universe. The in, entire universe is playing this Chekhov's play. And uh, the who playing it is a wave and particle. They became, they became personalized. Just, it's a very, it's just a very beautiful balance here to create this uh, inter indetermin indeterminate non-binary state. Let me tell you this. I don't know if you are familiar with the uh, uh, Chekhov's Sega. In in Sega, there is a play in play. The play is about uh, this young romantic playwright. Um, he's fiercely in love with a, a country girl and uh, he wrote a play. This play is about, this play is a science fiction. This play is about uh, 20 million years into the future when all lives die out. Mind you, this play was was written in 1896, one year after the success, the phenomenal success of uh, H.G. Wells' novel, The Time Machine. So this moment of uh, 20, 000, uh, 20 
million years into the future is very similar to the scene described by H.G. Wells. But uh, Chekhov considered H.G. Wells was bad taste. So he made a laugh of that. So he made this scene very, very laughable. But the play itself eventually shows the unpredictability, uh, the unpredictability and uh, the absurdity of the universe. So eventually when all the human affairs, the story of human affairs unfold in Sega, actually you will remember what eventually happened is very similar to this H.G. Wells moment, the dying out of everything. So the gun is fired, the protagonist killed himself. And there is also the tagline of the play is that there's a beautiful seagull, but a man comes seeing the seagull, kills that seagull for no reason. It's cute. Then the play is about uh, something quite mysterious. Do, do I have the time just to read? I, see, I really want to read this to you so you can see what I mean. Okay, here I give you three paragraphs that I translate, um, maybe not very good, uh, but this translation um, can give you a sense of the text, how, why they are difficult to read because they often put the take off quotations into the text, but the quotations sometimes are modified. Okay, here I begin. Uh, so this uh, country girl, which the playwright is uh, fiercely in love with, is called Nina. So first is we hear the Nina is talking. Nina says, man, lands, eagles, and the partridges, Horned deer, geese, spiders, silent fish that dwell in the water, starfishes that creatures which cannot be seen by eyes, all living things, all living things, all living things, having completed their circle of sorrow, are extinct. These are from Chekhov's play in play. For thousands of years, the earth has borne no living creature on its surface, and this pool moo lights its lamp in vain. It is cold, empty, dreadful. The bodies of living creatures have vanished into dust. An eternal matter has transformed into rocks, into water, into cloths, while the souls of all have melted into wine. That, wo that word soul, I am, is me. I, in me, the consciousness of a man is blended with the instincts of the animals, and I remember all, all, and I live through every life once again, all over again in myself. And this, of course, because the playwright is fiercely in love with this girl, so she made it female. It's in the, but this female, in description, she has both Napoleon and, a, and an insect. A Napoleon lives in her. An insect also lives in her. So she's the one, she's like the Gaia. She's like a, what Harvey calls this, uh, eventually this, monstr this uh, uh, manifestation of the monstrosity in one single um, life. But here, diptery, which is an insect, is going to give us a, a new perspective. She breaks this one single life into two. There are two, okay. Of course, they're Russian. So there, this description. Uh -huh. They were born in the north. The long summer days are warming up Lake Bagar. 
fully equipped, they dive into explore the bottom of the lake. The underwater forest only has scarce vegetation. They believe they have reached the end of the universe. In winter, they run in the cold of 40 Fahrenheit degree below zero. And I can see the Milky Way in the sky on a sunny day. By the end of the spring, trees are still sprouting and they are watching the opening to the ancient eternal built in the 20th century with their four legs dinkling in, ryth in, ryth in rhythmic and a cheerful ways. One is watching the zigzag tracks far away, supporting the train that enters the tunnel. The other is listening to the sound of the train closer and closer. They seize the opportunity, jump into the ancient train. Following the tracks, they come from the far eastern backwater all the way to the source. So in this paragraph, this soul becomes a couple of girls, two girls. But furthermore, the earth has never abandoned its past, even after humans begin their evolutions. Thousands of years, millions of years later, human exp expedition feed back on the earth, making it a living fossil that keeps glowing, uh, uh, keeps growing, giving birth to layers of layers of tree rings that record its own growth, that planet is indeed an ecological museum of human civilization, populated by both the pre-modern tribes and the non-human beings of the 29th century. Now we are in the 29th century. They hide themselves in the third class trains. Now the girls, the two girls uh, appear again. They hide themselves in the third class trains third class carriages, mingling with people and things that they have never seen, they managed to survive completing a macro history of evolution equivalent to an entire millennium for human beings. When the train reached the edges of the Indian Ocean, she has learned how to process all the quantum of images, and she has learned how to record all the quantum sounds. They have become the senior engineers who adventure into the new frontiers of the universe. Everyone wants to have them, recruiting them to join their crew. They choose a monster named Leviathan, which takes them to reach the limits of the human world with the maximum speed. The entire route is more challenging than imagined. They have turned from Camouflage hidden in the trains into the predators in space. They have learned to live in narrow space and die in the cosm cos die in the cosmos of enormous magnet magnitude. They have overcome all kinds of uncertainties in life and have reached the end of the universe again. These seem to be a cliff. There seems to be a cliff in the void, standing on the edge of the cliff, they simultaneously catch sight of the birth and death of the stars. Further away, they see the unknown desolate. Humans have not found a way to make a first step into the void. And uh, we, you know, the, the narrative will eventually reveal these two girls, are wave particles. They are interchangeable. They are also gender changeable. They play the two, way, two women characters in the play. So they are part of the representation, but they are also conceiving a new reality, a new universe. So Chekhov's light comedy eventually becomes the divine comedy, the cosmic comedy that ends with a, a totally new non-binary universe. This text I praised very much. And uh, I just want to mention these names, Ling Chen, 
uh, for a long time, she was low, overlooked, but uh, I, I, lately I read so many interesting stories written by her, including one story called the 404 uh, uh, Dragon Invisible. It's perfect for me. It's about a dragon. It's about a dragon appears in Beijing city, but uh, you have to follow for the dragon. So in Beijing, everyone knows this dragon roaming everywhere, but all the news reports have to hide the dragon. So it's a very funny, it's a, um, but she has other things. But she's one of the authors who tried to write like a man. Her narrative is very similar to Liu Cixin. Um, doesn't have too much like female, but in a certain way, I don't want, I hate to see the female traits, but I just want to see she avoids the gender question in her stories. Oh, Zhao Haihong, Zhao Haihong's stories are much more diverse and she, she can write a very cold uh, kind of a mechanical stories, very, much like the hard science fiction. But she also writes stories like Baobei, Baobei, Waini, like Baby, Baby, I Love You, uh, stories like that. Um, and I, I remember she wrote one story, almost like a joke. In that story, um, it, it, in that story, she depicts that she she talks with Liu Cixin um, at a place and after they depart, she somehow, she, keep transforming from one person to another person. And this transform, transformation happened six times until she calls Liu Cixin up to ask what happens. The Liu Xin has no idea. Liu Xin does not even remember seeing her. It's quite a mysterious in this process. She transforms from man to woman, from woman to man, back and forth, back and forth. Um, this is a very interesting story. And then Xia Jia, I, I, I literally really, uh, I, I particularly read her in English, made, made me see her in New Latin, but she's very famous, so I will not say too much about her. Hao Jingfang, she's super famous, so I will not say about her. And Chi Hui, I really think Chi Hui uh, deserves more attention. Um, I rediscovered, uh, her stories about uh, the the horror element, you know, like rainforest is uh, is always the you know when, whenever I teach science fiction, my students always choose the rainforest as their favorite story, not their scene story. The rainforest is about a woman, a woman warrior who eventually merge into the forest, become the one with the trees. Um, non-binary and uh, trans species. And Chi Hui also wrote a quite, quite a few stories about fake people vision. Uh, fake people, I, lately I just discovered how interesting that was, but for a long time it was overlooked and she never won a major award from Chinese science fiction circle. I thought she was uh, uh, underestimated. Uh, Cheng Jingbo, uh, Cheng Jingbo's writings are, uh, some stories are quite uh, sweet, like uh, fairy tales, but she wrote one story, which is really, really marvelous, that's Gan Zai Xian Luo Zhi Qian. Um, I don't have time to talk about it, sorry. It's, uh, you can, you can read it before, before the collapse of the city, yes. Gan Zai Xian Luo Zhi Qian. Now, Tang Fei is, the central figure of this she SM because she has the consciousness, she has a self-conscious of the she SM, as a non-binary, self-conscious of the non-binary thinking. Uh, highly recommend the Tang Fei. And the Gu Shi camera, and we are all camera in the Mobius time space. These are just so marvelous uh, examples for me to use to illustrate uh, this uh, CSF. Uh, but again, I won't give you the spoilers here. You need to read these stories yourselves. 
and the Mu Ming uh, her first collection of stories is, is uh, finally forthcoming. I I, I particularly like uh, Gu Shi and uh, Mu Ming uh, using very uh, uh, you, they both have a very nice balance between reason and imagination. They both use very strict scientific calculation to set up the plot and then create the marvelous uncertainty above it. Uh, and also Wang Kan Yu, she's, uh, she's also super famous. And uh, Wang Nuo Nuo, I just begin to know her stories, not yet too much. Uh, Duan Zixi, I also just begin to, you can see the age, they're younger and younger. Uh, and George Eliot, <laughs> why George Eliot? Okay, why George Eliot? Because George Eliot translated Spinoza, introduced the, Spinoza to the Victorian British people. Well, Spinoza was long forgotten in the history of philosophy for hundreds of years. But uh, I think for all this non-binary philosophy, we own something to Spinoza. The Spinoza legacy is the most powerful heritage we have uh, to help us uh, get into a, a quite important dialogue with humanism. Okay, I think uh, the second wave is, uh, can be characterized as a process from Kant to King, in which we can find new wonders of the non-binary universe. Thank you very much. I used too much time. Sorry, I should stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mingwei, uh, for this thought-provoking presentation. Uh, we had a glimpse of your long presentation, PPT. Uh, it would be great if we have opportunities to have a science fiction research seminar series, so you can <laughs> you can cover all the grounds. Um, yeah, I uh, we have received a number of questions. I think some of them you have already answered in your presentation. Uh, we've got a question from Mia Ma. Uh, she graduated mm. from uh, my department recently. She also shared with me uh, Shuang Chi Mu, you mentioned in your talk, is a female uh, writer. She actually teaches at the philosophy department in Nanjing University, uh, Shuang Chi Mu. And so Mia's question is, uh, I'm particularly interested in the idea of binary text you brought up earlier. Uh, if we can read Liu Cixin's three-body trilogy as non-binary text, what constitutes the core of such binary text? Would the pursuing of science fictional poetics possibly play a role in defining or redefining non-binary text? Yes, this is a, thank you, Mia. This is, a, of course, Mia is a, um, a, a great scholar herself, a very promising young scholar herself. And uh, um, you know so much about this generation of women writers. Um, I, um, non-binary text, okay. These this, this terms are used for, for convenience. But uh, if you ask me to define it, uh, we need to go to really the philosophical definition that uh, will take us a, a little more uh, than just a textual definition. I, but I, here, I just want to see, um, uh, this is in part of my, my, my larger thinking about uh, uh, what happens after modernity. I think modernity is very much based upon binary, a lot of binary, categories. I think what's happening now is uh, uh, opening up a new time. What I define as a contemporary, actually this book, um, uh, Fear of Seeing is, uh, is only volume one of uh, what I'm writing as a, a trilogy of uh, what is contemporary. I think this contemporary is the new Baroque, but uh, new Baroque is only 
a sign. Uh, it does not hide everything, it cannot cover everything. But I, I think what is happening is certainly um, something better than postmodern. <laughs> Just like I, I think postmodern is a very bad word, like post socialist, all very lame words, not very creative. I think the non boundary, the new baroque is what's happening now. And, uh, but it does not mean that it's totally new, as I, as I finally mentioned. You know, if we go back to Spinoza, we will find abundant resources. And going back to the Baroque age, we will find a lot of um, inspirations. So a poeticness, uh, yes, poeticness, if we, uh, if we use Suyang Chu's definition, metaphor itself can be non-binary. I, I, I don't think I answered the question, but I, I, I hope I open up the question a little bit. Yeah. Well, since you, you just mentioned the new Baroque, uh, we have a follow-up question. Uh, it seems you used the new Baroque to refer to post-socialist state. Um, but this audience, um, Lorenzo and Fata asked- Yeah, uh, Lorenzo, yeah. Mm. Yeah, could you uh, elaborate on the category of the new Baroque? Does mm. it relate to the space opera feeling of works by Liu Cixing or Bao Shu? Mm. Thank you, Lorenzo. Lorenzo is another wonderful, great young scholar. Yeah. I had, the, I had the fortunate meeting person. Um, the new Baroque, um, I use it to, to refer to science fiction. So new, new Baroque is already part of my definition of the, what science fiction is. It, uh, it, it, it centers on, the, uh, on wonder, on a wonder that goes beyond the regulations and the regularities. So um, certainly Bao Shu is new Baroque, but Liu Cixin, if we look at the moment of uh, two dimensional, I would say most, you know, for the three body trilogy, maybe 80% of the text do not read like Baroque. They are very straightforward, very logic. But if we read those crazy moments like uh, the Arweihua, the two dimensionalization of the universe, when one molecule can be as large as uh, an ocean, uh, those moments, I think it's, uh, it has a, um, this uh, uh, new Baroque uh, sublime. I, I, uh, but I think I use the, the word choice may not be very good. Maybe we should say new Baroque sublime. It certainly has the new Baroque uh, feel, uh, which uh, which goes even beyond the conscious sublime, um, because conscious sublime is a uh, is to see the you know to 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 to, to confront the in informidable uh, mag 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 magnitude, uh, magnificent, then we are odd. But Liu Cixin is not just odd, it still goes to give us all the details. So that is like Baroque, that is very much like Baroque. The Baroque gave us a new map a star map or a atlas of the world, but it's filled with all the imaginary wonders. So yes, that fits. And uh, um, to me, I think uh, if we we consider the quantum physics as a sign of the epistemology shift in the new Baroque age that began 120 years ago. 
So it's not just like a, a very new thing. We may have been living in the middle of the new Baroque age, just not knowing it yet. But uh, after all, it's only a name. What matters is how we deal with, you know, sincere, sincerely deal with this feeling. Maybe a new Baroque, this world can be changed, but we are facing this, uh, uh, this tremendous unknown uh, becoming, yeah. Of course, Deleuze is another source for us to use, you know, quite a lot of uh, useful words to, to borrow, okay. yeah. Uh, we have another question from Jingfei Zhang, a former MA student from uh, Chinese Studies at SOAS. Thank you, Professor Song, for this very inspiring lecture. You mentioned the poetic characteristics of science fiction. I'm wondering if these lyrical poetry features are unique to science fiction, how to understand this connection between lyric poetry and science fiction. Is it possible that other genres of fictions also have this fe feature, uh, for example, fantasy fictions? Yes, of course. I, I think, of course. Of course, poet, um, all fiction can be poetic, of course. Even realism can be poetic. Uh, uh, the reason why uh, I borrowed uh, the idea from Suyang Chu to emphasize the, the, the affinity between poetic uh, tradition and uh, science fiction is that uh, we rarely think that way. We, we, we usually think they are, they are, they are at, at too far remote ends, but, uh, but Ken Liu truly inspired me to think that uh, his science fiction is poetry. And I, I believe fantasy, of course, has that. Even horror has that. Even, uh, let's say, even Realism has it has has that, so it's not uh, uh, exclusively uh, science fiction. It's it's not unique. It's uh, it's it's the reverse. I try to unpack science fiction to let us see its poetic dimension. It's it's not a definition. Uh, all I have said should not be taken as a statement of certainty, but rather brainstorming, yeah. Okay, so uh, we only have time for one more question. I think maybe Yan, Yan, Yan Ong, she, she's a science fiction writer, also an editor based in London, I think. Yan, okay, Yan, so maybe. Yan Ong's question, um, can you share the definition of an indeterminate non-binary state? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this, what, what I mean by this is that uh, just like I, I talk about the wave, part, uh, wave particle in the text of uh, Shang Chi Mu, the Sala Studio Seiko, it's uh, uh, they are forever changing. You cannot decide whether it's wave or particle. Just like the protagonist, uh, um, the crew member on the stage, he's like the narrative. He can never tell the difference between the two girls. You can never tell the difference between the wave and the particle. You can never tell the difference between um, whether it is a Chekhov or it's a, a fake Chekhov, <laughs> uh, whether it's a real Chekhov quotation or it's a fake Chekhov quotation, whether it is a, a, a text that is meant to be uh, literal or it's meant to be specula speculative. So indeterminate uh, non-binary is uh, is a more like a metaphysical or physical quantum physics, um, a certain feature of that, which is brought into the text of the of science fiction. I I think that that's a that. That's the reason why Shuang Shimu's text is very difficult to read. I, I had to read it uh, a few times to totally understand it. Uh, and I also corresponded with the author a lot to, to, to test whether what I meant is, uh, is truly what she meant. Uh, sometimes I found what I meant is not what she meant. But uh, again, I like that it's, uh, you know, it's also 
indeterminate. Even the author, the author reader relationship can also be non-binary in a certain sense. We both create a field okay. in which we understand it. Yeah. So, Professor Song, since your uh, the talk, the title of your talk uh, refers to you no know, she sci-fi. I really want to raise a uh, read out this final question from Michael. Mm -hmm. Current, a PhD candidate at Harvard University. Yes, yes, of based course. On your, yeah, based on your talk, it seems like there are many ways to capture the type of differences you see science fiction as pointing to non binary, baroque, and so on. What do we gain by approaching this discussion from the perspective of gender as opposed to putting the baroque at the center? Why situate this discussion in light of the rising generation of women sci-fi writers in China? Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Michael. This is a fantastic question. Um, I, I uh, why gender? Because gender is uh, um, the is is still the ceiling. Uh, what you call the Tianhuabai, you know, the, I think we need to break the, we need to make a break in gender in order to change a lot of things. Uh, so it is my strategy indeed. I, if I just uh, throw up the Baroque, uh, throw up the uh, uh, non-binary, things like that, uh, um, it will not make me a big enemy to the, system. <laughs> well, I don't I don't want to be a big enemy to the system, but I do want to provocative, you know, to be pro as provocative as possible. So um, last year, about this time, last year I wrote that article, uh, New Wonders of a Non-Binary Universe, published it in April in Shanghai Wenxue. After that article was published, uh, all of all of us, you know, suddenly people begin to target me, target me as a spokesman, a spokesperson for women writers um, in a very bad way. They, they thought that uh, I, I, tried, I tried to subvert something. I think it's exactly because in China, the gender issue is still the high ceiling we need to break. So, so that is why I say to this, this discussion in light of the rising generation of women sci-fi writers. But of course, if you read my, you know, for to the English audience, um, in in this book, I I I I, I talk about the Baroque, talk about the binary. Um, but they are all connected. There's a it's just very important to uh, to resist the ossification of uh, any categories in this. Thank you, Michael. This is a, a very good question. The time is up, unfortunately. So I'm afraid we have to wrap up today's webinar. Thank you again, Professor Mingwei Song, for giving us this wide ranging and thought provoking talk. I'm sure we are all looking forward to reading your uh, forthcoming book. I'd also like to thank our audience members for your participation, and I wish to see you soon at our seminar events. Thank you. Bye.